Hi, I'm Rachel, and this is my Maybe Midrash wrap-up video. Uh, Maybe Midrash is a uh, readathon that was started on BookTube by Jason at Old Blue's Chapters and Verse, which uh, takes place in May, gives you the month of May to read one serious work of fiction and one serious work of nonfiction having to do with any world religion. And also, um, he added in uh, last year, um, watching a serious film on religion. And the readathon didn't happen officially this year, but I decided to go ahead and make myself a little TBR and uh, go through it anyway, so I'll link to that video down below. But now, of course, we're in June, and I've finished reading and watching everything, and I figured I would give my thoughts. So I thought I'd start with the film that I watched, which was part of a local uh, Jewish film festival last month. Uh, it is a French and Italian film called Where Life Begins, uh, in English, uh, and uh, you know, surprisingly it's about uh, French and Italian people. Uh, it takes place in Calabria and Italy on a farm, a citrus farm, run by a particular man or uh, who is part of a particular family. Uh, and his family and his father uh, has had this relationship with a uh, French Jewish family, the Zelniks, for uh, many years. Uh, uh, because um, Jews, for the holiday of Sukkot, use a, sp a specific type of citrus called the etrog uh, for uh, ritual purposes. And uh, this family from France has gone out of their way to Calabria to uh, collect the most perfect citruses for the community. And so every uh, year for two weeks, the Zelniks come from France, uh, they're an ultra-Orthodox family, and they come to uh, collect these citruses. Uh, and they have this uh, working relationship with uh, the farmer, Elio's family. Uh, and it's not always, you know, the best for business to, you know, uh, set all of it aside, uh, all of this aside for this family, but it's something that uh, the family has always done. And so we start with Elio, who is this non-Jewish farmer who's in a kind of weird position. Uh, because he is beholden to his father's memory. He came back from a life of art and artistry in Rome that he really loved, uh, but his father wanted him to run this farm. Uh, and he's trying to do it, but uh, times have been really tough. Uh, and uh, he's just debating like what best to do, but he feels very beholden to his father. Uh, and a Jewish character from the Zelnik family is kind of going through something similar. Esther is the daughter of uh, the head of the family, the rabbi, uh, and she is having this crisis of faith. And uh, through the trip, um, she bonds with Elio. She, you know, is secretly using his computer to uh, communicate with other uh, from uh, the religious people who are like um, questioning their reality, their faith, uh, and. Uh, Ultimately, like it comes out just how frustrated she is by how small-minded her faith is and how sort of uh, one-dimensional her life is and how much she really hates the way that she practices and the community practices the faith. It's, it's, it's very uh, petty and cruel and, you know, it's, you know, the literalist sort of uh, uh, vindictiveness of uh, how it's done. Like one of the most... Uh, arresting scenes to me as she and her uh, female family members are preparing food together and they're just uh, blithely and randomly talking about a community member who was in pain and they're just completely dismissing it and just being completely small-minded about it uh, because this community member had violated um, Shabbat uh, and uh, so this person's pain doesn't matter and it's just so vindictive this uh, complete and utter belief that uh, this pain doesn't matter, that uh, Esther sneaks away to beg God that she could stop believing in him because this is such an awful thing to believe in. <laughs> so uh, it's kind of heartbreaking in that way because uh, I practice a Judaism that's, I think, so much different and so much uh, more about uh, love and about challenging yourself always to uh, act with empathy even when it's difficult. And, uh, and there's no real, I think, um, uh, interpretation of scripture I, in the way that uh, I understand and practice Judaism that is that small-minded. First of all, the, the basis is always on debate anyway. So anyway, uh, it was an arresting film and uh, in a way it's kind of similar to uh, the uh, book, the fiction book, I should say, that I read uh, this year, which is Abomination by Ashley Goldberg, which also takes place in another um, 
uh, ultra-Orthodox Jewish community, uh, this time in Melbourne. Um, and we are following uh, two men uh, in the present day. They're in their 30s. Uh, but 20 years ago, they were school children in, you know, the uh, Frum uh, school, which was rocked by a sex scandal because uh, one of the, the major teachers there, Rabbi Hirsch, was... Um, secretly abusing uh, young boys for a long time, actually, but ultimately one of the families uh, of the victims uh, decided because the community refused to do anything about it, uh, that they uh, went to the police to try to get outside uh, help. Uh, and then the community went ahead and secretly ferried uh, Hirsch away to Israel so that he wouldn't have to stand trial. And it's been 20 years uh, and they uh, ostracized uh, this family uh, and the family has been um, rallying for all of those years, especially any time that an Israeli was visiting Australia to, um, you know, get them to uh, extradite Hirsch to stand trial. Uh, and, but all of this is actually kind of, you know, backstory to these uh, main characters who were following these childhood friends, one of whom uh, his family left the community after what happened with Hirsch, uh, and he is now very secular. And then the other one, um, his family was far more religious, and uh, the other member is now an, an ordained rabbi who uh, teaches at the school himself. And they're both going through uh, personal crises themselves. Uh, uh, the uh, secular man, Ezra, is uh, dealing uh, uh, with... Uh, issues of intimacy and how he's uh, kind of personally sabotaging uh, his relationship with his girlfriend. Uh, and, uh, you know, he meets up with uh, Yonatan for the first time in 20 years. They actually uh, see each other across the way at one of these uh, rallies against Hirsch. Uh, and uh, it kind of brings up a bunch of the ostracization he faced as a not quite from boy in the ultra-Orthodox community at school. And then Yoni, uh, Attending this rally, uh, which is completely forbidden in the community, uh, really uh, gives gets him uh, embroiled in the start of a crisis of faith uh, about, uh, tr particularly about uh, you know the hypocrisies of uh, what is uh, con considered an okay sort of sin to sort of uh, cover up, and then the ways that uh, other people like himself. Uh, are ostracized uh, for basically stepping away from the community, like uh, the fact uh, that they would, uh, you know, make the outside world look at them negatively or do anything against uh, sort of the strictures of the community is just considered uh, completely off the rails. Uh, but, you know, there's a major uh, thing in so many fundamentalist religions that they um, protect abusers because I, I think there's just not much within fundamentalist communities that is able to deal with um, systemic problems of abuse because it then, uh, you know, the, the beliefs can be so binary that, you know, there's just not an easy way to deal with that. So that's why there's so much hypocrisy. I mean, and, and a lot of people look so negatively on uh, ultra-Orthodox uh, Judaism and, and similar religions. Uh, you know, there could, you know, be positive parts of the community, but the negatives of, uh, of this hypocrisy, of this binary thinking that uh, oftentimes, uh, you know, protects abusers because they can't, you know, unravel the faith. Uh, and yet also can be so cruel to uh, people who step away uh, and, you know, uh, question the faith. It's just, it's, there's something so uh, cruel to it. Uh, so uh, Yonatan, actually, who's the religious member, he's going through a similar crisis of faith as Esther in the, in the uh, movie. So that's a lot of uh, negatives, in fact, about religious Judaism right there in that uh, novel, in that film. So uh, my nonfiction uh, pick is a little bit of a salve. It's a little bit of a corrective, I might even say. This is called Dear Shuni, Contemporary Women's Midrash, edited by Tamar Biala, which, of course, I would have to read for a readathon named after Midrash. Uh, Midrash uh, is a Jewish form of a uh, um, dealing with the text and challenging the text. And I mean, it's been around since like the first century CE and uh, the rabbis uh, who were uh, writing out uh, some of the earliest texts beyond the, the, uh, t the Torah. Uh, so I don't know, this whole idea of a religion that is just completely um, stuck in one way of thinking is just such an anathema even to how I understand ancient Judaism. Uh, 
But that being said, uh, for so much of history, uh, a lot of those thinkers who went ahead and uh, challenged the Torah and wrote so many different sorts of interpretations of things, uh, we're still coming at it from a particularly male-only point of view. Uh, and so there are a lot of um, blind spots still, and well, I guess I'd say unempathetic spots toward uh, other people perhaps, uh, that uh, could be filled. And so in the modern age, as women have become more involved uh, in a lot of Judaism, including aspects of, modern, of Orthodox Judaism, um, there's been this uh, outgrowing, I think starting even in the U.S. Uh, with the feminist movement of women who are writing their own midrash and their own uh, interpretations and arguments and so forth with the texts. And then this one is from Israel. Uh, this is a um, collection that was uh, published in English pretty recently, but uh, this group of women in Israel uh, published two other collections in Hebrew previously. And so what the women are doing here, it's not just, you know, arguing uh, without uh, uh, rules uh, with uh, the Torah or anything. There are specific ways to reinterpret uh, the Torah, um, ways of... Um, uh, comparing and contrasting different parts of scripture or playing with uh, Jewish, uh, with Hebrew language uh, in different ways to uh, make different meanings. And so it's, it's a fascinating book, but also you kind of have to be somewhat embroiled and have some understanding of uh, the religious texts and, and Hebrew. Uh, so it's not something I, I, you know, I read this all very quickly, but it really is something more that you pour over slowly, uh, these, uh, these midrashim, uh, and uh, it would be, you know, make, make even more meaning the, the more religious, uh, you know, knowledge you have yourself. Uh, I have some, but I, I'm not, for example, fluent in Hebrew, but uh, I could get some out of it. Uh, out of this. It's it's a fascinating uh, and challenging book, but also ultimately a hopeful book where, again, we're bringing the empathy back into religious Judaism, so uh, it's a bit of a salve. So anyway, I thought I would compare and contrast these two books with um, some text study, which again sort of fits into the, uh, well, certainly the idea of this readathon, which is based on uh, the idea of Midrash. So I thought I'd start with uh, talking about uh, Ezra's uh, crisis and uh, abomination, where he's talking actually with a counselor after he's had sort of, um, you know, a breakdown of sorts um, at, the, at, at work, and they set him up with a counselor to sort of... Uh, sort himself out, uh, and he ultimately starts talking about his issues with intimacy, and uh, this is uh, what the counselor comes up with. Relationships don't always work. You're not broken because you didn't love someone who loved you. Better communication might have helped, or it might have led to the resolution of your relationship sooner. What's important right now is that we figure out what lies beneath your bad behavior, and then, with a greater understanding of why you feel the way you do, you might be able to mediate yourself accordingly in the future. I actually, to be fair, found that to be a relatively shallow start. I mean, it doesn't even really deal specifically uh, with what Ezra is going through, although he, he talks about it, but it's not like the therapist and him truly parse out what... Uh, his, uh, you know, memories of his childhood or whatever mean in, in a lot of great depth. So in this uh, instance, I feel like I can get something a little deeper out of Dear Shuni. <laughs> and I wanted to talk about two types of intimate relationships that Tamar Biala brings up uh, in her midrash called For Love is as Fierce as Death. And she is comparing how intimacy is described in Ezekiel versus the Song of Songs. And here are a couple examples. Ezekiel said, I clothed you, put shoes on you, covered your head, and cloaked you. Comes the Song of Songs and says, Let me see your face. Turn back, turn back, so we might gaze upon you. Ezekiel said, And you will be ashamed to open your mouth again. Comes the Song of Songs and says, Oh, you who linger in the garden, a lover is listening. Let me hear your voice. So yeah, this is a very... um midrashic way of, uh, of uh, juxtaposing the text. Like you start with the one that maybe you're challenging and says, well, this is what some part of scripture says, but then comes this other part that challenges it. And uh, the challenge here is that in a lot of ways, Ezekiel looks at uh, an intimate relationship as a possession and ownership. But uh, the Song of Songs responds, as you will, 
uh, with something that's about something much more mutual uh, in intimacy. Each of uh, these midrashim, uh, much like uh, traditional Jewish texts, also have commentaries beyond uh, the midrashic uh, tales. Uh, and in this commentary for this uh, midrash, uh, it says, Biala's juxtaposition of the verses from each of these biblical books leads to a preference for the model presented in the Song of Songs, which is based on egalitarianism and trust. Next, I want to move on to Yonatan and his crisis of faith in abomination, which comes to a head because uh, he, you know, once the community becomes aware of him going to this rally they don't want him to go to, and even uh, getting together with Ezra, who is someone who's no longer religious, they start to ostracize him because he is not acting as a moral man in keeping with their strictures. Uh, but, uh, and that's obviously very painful for him. It's very painful in a religious, uh, uh, in a community like this, uh, in ultra-Orthodoxy, your religion is very much based on your place in the community. So to be ostracized is very painful, and then it also brings up the hypocrisy of how someone like Hirsch, who also has committed sins, is treated instead, or, you know, argu arguably worse sins, uh, but anyway. Here is uh, Yoni actually explaining his situation to Ezra near the end of the book when he is... Uh, taking a break, as it were, from uh, his community. A full life. Could anyone ask for more? And I was given that. A devoted wife, a good job, the warmth and support of innumerable community, a place in the world. And so I gave back. I davened each day, as Hashem asked, with the kavanah of the most devout men. I studied Talmud and received smicha and wept for the destruction of the temple, begged forgiveness for the sinful doubts that I had buried, and I sang with an unbridled jubilation in celebration of my people's freedom for their chosenness. But now, now, I wake, and when my lips instinctively form the words for Mode Ani, I feel sick. Yona paused and took a deep breath. Why? Ezra wanted to ask, but he stayed silent. How can I recite the same words as those who excuse the abusers of children, who protect those abusers and punish their victims. And for what? The appearance of piety, tradition. Is that worth the life of a child? Ayala Tsuria confronts uh, communal attitudes toward victims of sexual abuse in her midrash, uh, the daughter of, Z of Dina. Dina, who is the only daughter of our patriarch Jacob, who in turn gave birth to 12 sons who became the 12 tribes of Israel, uh, uh, by the interpretation of um, scripture in Genesis uh, that most people go with, uh, she was uh, raped by an outsider to the community. And then a first century midrash by a Rabbi Eliezer extrapolates that she gave birth to a daughter because of the rape, uh, and that daughter in fact becomes uh, the wife of uh, Joseph. Uh, the reason that uh, this midrash uh, talks about uh, Dina giving birth to a daughter is because uh, they had to justify Joseph getting married to someone who seemed Egyptian, but actually would be a member of the Jewish faith. Uh, so that's why um, Asnat came into being. Uh, but uh, through this story, uh, Eliezer uh, goes on to say that uh, Dina's brothers uh, named Asnat Asnat to um, indicate the shame of the rape. But Surya engages in a lot of the standard linguistic uh, acrobatics with Hebrew, which uh, is uh, endemic to a lot of the Midrashim, uh, both, you know, uh, ancient and modern. And her point is uh, to uh, try to rearrange uh, the letters uh, to show some sympathy for this young girl and Dina's predicament. So the modern Midrash says, Jacob's sons called Dina's daughter Asnat, that the disgrace of her birth should be remembered, and that her mother remember her disaster, Ason, and her rape, Ones, and that she went out to see the daughters of the land, which is uh, something uh, that comes straight from uh, the Bible. Uh, and Jacob took note. The, the words uh, took note are also from the Bible. Uh, he said, and then the Midrash continues, he said, don't call her Asnat, but Atnes, literally, you are a miracle. And he marked her with a gold frontlet, and he dressed her in a coat of many colors to save her from them. And uh, that is alluding to uh, the fact that he also uh, dressed Joseph, who then becomes her husband, in a coat of uh, many colors. And the commentary extrapolates, Jacob is presented as an oppositional force to his sons. He knew about the rape and the birth, but, but he kept the matter to himself, just as he did when it came to the strained relationship between Joseph and his brothers. For Jacob, the name Asnat is a sign of honor, 
He interprets the name by shifting around the letters, calling it Atnes, meaning you are a miracle. This name does not just empower Asnat by conferring legitimacy on her existence, but also regards her birth as miraculous. And the commentary concludes with this paragraph, Ayalat Syria highlights various human responses to rape and the fruits of such an illicit union. Jacob's noble and impressive behavior becomes a model for others. He is not afraid of what other people will think. He acts independently to cleanse Asnat's reputation and secure her place in society, thereby sparing her from the fate that would otherwise have befallen her. So yeah, yeah, this is again, uh, you know, reading between the lines of uh, what was in the Torah to uh, extrapolate uh, an empathetic uh, vision of how a community should respond to sexual abuse. Uh, and it's something that uh, now we have some justification uh, to uh, go forward with. And finally, I wanted to give note and abomination to the plight of uh, Yoni's uh, wife, Rivka, who uh, is pregnant throughout most of the book, but in the back of uh, the story, we know that Yoni has his doubts because he knows he is infertile. So the baby did not come from him, which is again, very much against uh, the mores of the community. She got pregnant in another way. Uh, and uh, as he is going through his crisis of faith, he still, uh, you know, challenges her on that. But she challenges him back. She tells him, tell me what you know about being a woman, a Jewish woman. My hair is shorn and I, and I cover it lest I cause a man to have immodest thoughts. I go to mikveh every month and cleanse myself because I have been told that I am impure and my husband cannot touch me otherwise. What do you know of the pain of performing a bedekah, inserting the cloth inside myself and looking for a stain of my uncleanliness? What do you know of the humiliation of my presenting my bedekah cloth to Rab Feiner so he can confirm that I am clean or declare me nida? Rivka pulled her long brown shtidal and the calf beneath it from her head and threw it onto the couch. Tufts of her short hair are pointed out in all directions. Be fruitful and multiply. Hashem does not need my prayers, but he needs my womb. What was it I meant to do? Keep delivering other people's children, blessing their health and happiness? She shook her head, tears formed at the edges of her eyes. Do you know what the other women were saying behind my back? Cursed by Hashem, they said, Akara. I know that many chose other doulas over me because they feared I would somehow infect them, cause stillbirth or sterility in their children. For six years, I prayed for Hashem to grant us a child. Every Shabbat for six years, when I was not Nida, I opened up my heart and my body, and for six years, Hashem refused me. Have I not otherwise lived a halachic life, been an ideal akaret habayit, and created a Jewish household, a sanctuary for Hashem? Give me children, or I shall die. I know how Rachel felt, because that's again a, a, a quote from scripture. <laughs> what do you know? Do you not thank him every day for not having made you a woman? So yeah, I really appreciated this for the reminder of how other people in the story, not just Yoni, are struggling within the uh, confines of their community and how to deal with uh, the um, gulf between what's expected and uh, what the reality is of their situation in uh, in. Uh, Rivka's case, it's that uh, her infertile husband is keeping her from uh, basically uh, fulfilling one of the only things she's meant as a woman to fulfill in the community. And of course, she ends her speech by invoking an actual traditional prayer that uh, men recite every day, thanking God to not be created a woman. And there's a lot of apologetics about that prayer out there. But it also has become the reason in modern days that women have turned to their own studies and own interpretations and own uh, debates and arguments with the faith. Tamar Biala invokes this particular faith specifically in her introduction to Dershuni. Uh, she starts with, in the second volume of the Hebrew Dershuni, Rivka, a coincidental name, uh, Lubitsch, captures the dead end in which we found ourselves. There was a little girl who would pester her mother and ask, why do the males humiliate us, saying, blessed is he who did not make me a woman? and she would bring her all the answers and excuses in the world, and they did not put her mind at ease. And then it goes on from there with other uh, examples of uh, how uh, the faith has been used to sort of uh, ostracize and uh, other women. And the um, 
answer, a modern answer, is basically to remove strictures around gender in this way and to allow women to uh, involve themselves in these uh, religious opportunities to grapple with the texts as human beings in their own right. So this is what Viola continues. At about the same time, and usually unaware of each other, without knowing, some of the women who were studying Torah in different B'nai Midrash, houses of study all over Israel, having acquired the knowledge of the tradition and the literary tools and techniques through which the tradition is written, women began to use these tools in their attempt to bridge the gap between their feminism and the patriarchy of the sacred texts. They hoped that in so doing, they would still be able to keep the sacred texts in their lives as moral and spiritual anchors. In the language of Talmudic and Kabbalistic Midrash, some of them began to express their life experiences as women, their existential insights and theological perspectives on the matters they had studied. Through this writing, they at last discovered a way to find themselves and their voices on the sacred Jewish bookshelf and to convey, as did the Talmudic sages, their opinions on ethical, spiritual, and legal questions, even if it was only kept for themselves. So yeah, to uh, tie up loose ends again, the whole idea behind this sort of volume is not to break away from tradition, but basically to recapture it, to allow new people to the table to do what men have done uh, for thousands of years, to uh, look at these texts, which ha are, have enough room to uh, reinterpret and uh, find uh, stories with, and uh, new ideas within the cracks of the stories that spoke to their own times, but now women are using that uh, same more to speak to their times and to allow themselves a seat at the table. And in my mind, this keeps Judaism as a living religion that speaks to living people and continues to uh, generation after generation. And of course, it finally gives some voice to Jewish women. It would be nice to think of uh, the fictional Rivka having a place at this table as well to study with women and realize that uh, even in a religious context, her life doesn't only have to be defined by her fertility or her reproductive organs, uh, but there's just so much more that she can give and be involved with in the faith. So who knows, maybe that's where she and Yoni will ultimately end up, that they could find a middle ground somewhere. Uh and that about covers it for me. Uh, I will leave uh, links to my two uh, Goodreads reviews for both of these books listed down below, as well as the review I wrote on my Jewish DC blog uh, for the uh, film Where Life Begins. Uh, and anyway, I should be back on this channel, hopefully pretty imminently. I do have a lot of post-production to do with the, this video and my next video, which in fact I've already filmed. It's my page 112 tag. I, get, I do get so excited about that video. It's where I use spontaneity to uh, choose a book for my month's TBR, so stay tuned. That should be coming up soon. I want to thank Jason at Old Blues Chapters and Verse for bringing this readathon to BookTube and making it open-ended enough that, you know, people can uh, continue to uh, engage in it, even if there isn't an official uh, uh, framework going on this year. But I certainly hope uh, you'll be back next year if uh, your life allows it. And I hope maybe other people will uh, engage as well uh, and uh, find uh, something meaningful as I did in... Uh, talking seriously about religion in these sorts of texts. Anyway, onward to June reading now. A lot of uh, other exciting things on the docket, uh, and thanks so much for watching, everyone. I'll see you next time.